Have you ever found yourself obsessively tweaking your resume, hoping that one verb change will land you that job finally? Let's break down what the job hunt pipeline looks like and how to identify where your job search is breaking down, and then making sure you're spending your time fixing the right problems. The first step in the process is finding job postings. You need to refine your keywords so you're getting enough hits, but not too many that are long shots for you. For example, previous times I search, I'd look for Azure and data. Right now that lands 2000 postings on LinkedIn, a solid number many of which I'd feel qualified applying for. I can search data engineer and it returns over 10K. This might be too broad, and many might want experience in AWS or on-prem Hadoop, which I'm not interested right now. Sometimes I feel like expanding to AWS, and sometimes I'm lazy. How do you know if this is your problem area? If you're finding your keywords aren't giving you 20 plus good chances to apply to a week, you might need to use broader keywords. If you're sifting through too many that just don't apply to you, you might want to narrow it down. How do you solve this problem? Trial and error. Use a combination of skills and tools to zero in on jobs you'd be comfortable with. Your search should give you a handful of new postings on weekdays, with over half of them being good enough to apply to. Next, we send in the resume. It's going to go through an ATS, Applicant Tracking System, first. It will scan for keywords and either auto-reject or approve it. If you're getting a lot of instant rejection emails, make sure your resume has the same keywords that appear in the postings you've narrowed down. If it does, make sure your resume is ATS friendly. Certain fonts and formats are handled better by these systems. Then a recruiter is going to glance at it for about 15 seconds. They'll be making a snap decision if you're worth talking to or not. Remember that humans like patterns. Trying to stand out with a unique resume will just mean the recruiter scanning it will have to look in unusual spots for information, and that's not a good thing. How do you know if this is the problem area? You're getting rejections without getting any calls at all. How do you solve it if it is your problem? This is tricky because your resume has to be both machine-friendly for the ATS, but also human-friendly for a quick scan. There are a handful of free ATS testing sites. So do that for ATS, then give your resume to some people and have them look at it for 10 seconds for a quick look, then have them tell you what they got from it. If they're not saying the key three things you expect them to, you need to adjust. Next, you should be getting a call with a company recruiter or HR, possibly directly with the hiring manager, but that's less common. You should be able to deliver a clean elevator pitch about yourself, a less than a minute description of your background and focus. Their goal is to validate your resume, ensure that you can hold a conversation, gauge your interest in the position, and then some administration pieces like ensuring you're on the same page for salary and location, etc. Remember that these calls can be with less technical people, or at least not in the focus area you're applying to, as they have to recruit for a large variety of roles. So it's best to keep your answers higher level and only get more technical if they ask. This is not the time to dazzle them with your deep knowledge of complex topics. How do you know if this area is your problem? I mean, simply you're not getting to the next interview step. And how do you solve it if it is? Practice your elevator pitch until it's seamless. Practice talking about your complex technical accomplishments in an easy to understand business value way. For example, instead of, I optimize my Python data pipeline by implementing parallel processing using multi-processing modules to leverage multi-core processors efficiently, adding lightweight data serialization formats like Avro to reduce overhead and speed up data transfer. I might simplify that too. Our data pipelines were running really slow, meaning the AI models weren't getting the most up-to-date data available. By streamlining Python to use processing more efficiently, I was able to triple the speed of our pipelines. Now the order is gonna vary by companies, but you'll likely force some sort of technical check. This could be a take-home test, a live coding exercise, or a more presentation communication style exercise. This is the one that everybody prepares for. You get technical questions or problems, and you answer them. How do you know if this is your problem area? Having failed some of these, I'd say it's painfully obvious. But if not, it's when you get rejected after the technical assessment. And how do you solve it if it is your problem? If it's a technical problem, you just have to practice the tech questions whether lead code or more realistic ones. But if you already have the technical skills, you might just need to practice coding out of your comfort zone. On whiteboards or in Word, people watching and commenting on what you're doing, being able to talk through what you're doing as you do it. It's a stupid way to have people code, but it's what they do. 
And then there will be the interview with the hiring manager or the team. This could be a panel type of interview. It's possible this is combined with the technical interview, but I'd say more often than not, they're broken apart now. This could come before or after the technical. Make sure you ask the recruiter about the process because I find the mindset going into each of these interviews is very different. With the discussion interview, you'll likely be asked in detail about your skills and experiences. My approach here is to have five or so broad examples that I like to talk about and have practiced to perfection. And then no matter what they ask, like a good politician, I redirect it into an answer I have prepared. As long as it's tangentially related to the question, it tends to work. They're just trying to prompt into learning more about you anyway. You don't have to keep the answers short, but also don't drone on and bore them. This probably depends on your storytelling capabilities, but I would err on the side of shorter answers. In order to help guide them into asking what I want them to, this is where the resume comes back into play. Remember how before we optimized it for ATS and a recruiter 15 second glance? There's a lot of resume advice to keep it dense, blocky, and unpleasant to the eyes for these reasons, but now it's in the hands of people who are taking a few minutes to read it. They're going to use it to formulate questions to ask you. For this reason, I try to keep it still somewhat pleasant to look at for the people who are reading it in depth. Those five talking points I've prepared, I want them mirrored in my resume, encouraging the interviewer to ask me about them. That way, it's less awkward to pivot into the answers I've prepared. So again, if you're not hearing back after this interview step, it's your problem area. And how do you solve it if it is? Practice, practice, practice. Those prepared answers have to be perfect. You maybe want to adjust the resume too if they're not being led into asking you about these topics. But of course, if you're going back and adjusting the resume, you might affect the earlier pipeline of the process. If your prepared answers are way off from what you're being asked in a couple of these interviews, you might want to prepare a response that's more in line with the common questions you're getting. If you can record the questions during or immediately after the interview, it can help you find trends across several of them. And the last step is negotiations. I'm not going to give any advice on this because I suck at it. At this point, you should not be losing the job in negotiations. If you are, I imagine your salary is way off from the offer. Which if you do need to solve that problem, you know, at this point in my career, I establish salary expectations on the first call so it doesn't get to this point. I know the common advice is to delay as long as possible, but I don't think that's just realistic, especially when job postings have ranges from like 50,000 to 300,000. That's my experience with the end-to-end -end searching for a job and where I've run into roadblocks along the way and how I've had to adjust my approach based off of each of those.